Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. Malifaux is not a kind place. It chews people up and spits them out. The strongest may manage to survive, but as today's stories show, strength is not the only way to survive in Malifaux. And sometimes, strength is all but useless. We have two stories for you on today's episode. First, Snowflake, and then Pretty. I hope you enjoy them. Snowflake, A Chilling Tale of Darkness by Matthew Ritter A snowflake fell upon a hill. Never melting, it rests there still. Children's Poem Told Near the Northern Horn Greetings, Dauphin. We managed to recover your goods. The perishables had spoiled, though that is to be expected. The town we found them in was completely empty. There was evidence of violence, mostly a not small amount of blood. But as your goods were still present, it is unlikely robbers were to blame. We found the journal of the previous caravan leader. I have enclosed it with this letter. After reading it, even though it was near dusk, I had the men hitch up the wagon and ride out of there. What goods were still usable were sold to the buyer. He tried to negotiate a lower price in light of the delay. I convinced him to accept an amount slightly above the previously agreed figure, so as to keep up further trade with you. I pray you will forgive my haggling on your behalf. The journal entries of note begin at entry 23 and carry on until the final one at 29. I never did find the black book he mentions, though I must confess I did not search very thoroughly. I trust you will receive a letter from your treasurer in Southcrest containing a logistic and financial summation of the endeavour. If you wish to hire someone to traverse the hill referred to in the journal, I must inform you that my services are not available. Still, I hope that with this letter you will consider my duties to have been adequately discharged. Always yours. Guild Guard First Class, Tamantha Sadler. Journal Entry 23 The sound of wolves or wild dogs was readily apparent as we approached the small hamlet. By the time we arrived proper, they were gone. Probably heard us as we neared. They'd been feasting on the corpses, no doubt. There were only a few homes, tiny one- or two-room affairs, Couldn't have been more than eight or nine families living in the area. Poor buggers. Brigands, most likely. Not that there was much to take. It was easy enough to drag the bodies the dogs had pulled outside back into their respective homes. I feel safe in this place. Once raiders hit, they're rarely planning to ever come back. Some of the other men seem on edge. Something about how all the mirrors in the house were covered up. That's fairly common, though. Where I grew up, they used to do that in a house when a child was born. To keep the spirits from reaching out and strangling the baby while it slept. I may not be superstitious, but I won't be sleeping in any of the beds. Most of the homes are quite a mess, and the stench from the blood and other bits. I'll stay by the fire. We'll be gone tomorrow early, if I can keep the men from trying to give all the villages proper burials. We have a schedule to keep. Journal Entry 24 He's an idiot, waking everyone up and getting them riled with spook stories. I never liked him and his thin, pointed face. Never was good at names. I always call him Rat Face in my head. It fits even more now, claiming it couldn't have been brigands, that nothing was stolen. So, the world is full of sadistic men. If I spent the time and effort to raid some place and they had nothing, I might kill them all just to feel like I'd accomplished something and then leave it all to rot. It's pitch black out with no moon, and I can't get back to sleep. So here I am, wasting perfectly good candles and ink while the men swap nightmares and boogie stories. Ratface doesn't help pointing out that some of the bodies were dragged off towards a hill nearby. 
nothing will get him to stop. He has a counter for everything, insisting on terrifying himself and the others. The dogs couldn't have dragged it that way. Dogs would drag the bodies out towards the woods, not up a hill, he claims. As if he is an expert on dogs. What would bandits have use for with a corpse, he adds? Well, if they were the sadistic sort, all kinds of uses. The hill isn't helping either. Despite the lack of a moon, it can be seen from town, even with the fire going. Stark against the night sky, and unlike everywhere else in the area. Nothing seems to grow upon it. The men were calling it the Cursed Hill, but that quickly changed to the Black Hill. A very clever bunch I'm riding with. Journal entry 25 I still can't sleep. Not for the same reason as the others. They're all frightened. I just can't get any rest with them shuffling around and talking constantly. They'll all feel stupid once we ride out tomorrow in the light of day. Actually, they probably won't. They'll talk about it forever, and the Black Hill will become known as a spot of terrible magics and death. So, this is how superstitious silliness starts. Journal Entry 26 Ratface poisoned my dreams with all his talk. I managed to fall asleep, but not an hour later I was startled awake by my own mind. I wasn't the only one with a nightmare, of course, and the men who had them keep sharing them. They've convinced themselves they all have the same one. Considering how hard it is to remember one on a good day, I think they just need to stop. They've half morphed my own dream into their delusion. A simple enough dream. A figure, not particularly tall or short, but wearing a great coat. Not like the soldiers wear, like the one doctors do. Terrifying dark things, stained from all the surgeries they've performed. A doctor will never wash his coat. Makes them smell worse than the former inhabitants of this place but it lets you see the history of his work. Those coats always used to give me nightmares. You could always tell a doctor, always. My mother wanted me to go into the profession, but I refused. I was never going to wear a coat like that, heavy with the lives I had failed to save. Look at me, that's pretty good. Definitely getting in the morbid mood, listening to all of them talk about the dream. Right, the figure with the doctor coat, long of course and buttoned all the way up. The figure held an executioner's axe, chipped and worn with use. And instead of a face, it wore a mask, porcelain. Somehow it reminded me of a plague doctor's mask, even though it was smooth, without any features. Not blank, though. Splashed with blood in a way that kept changing every time I looked away. The splatter on the white mask seemed to suggest intent or expression, like blood was its face. That's the thing about dreams, isn't it? Things can be other things. It's all very silly. Still, just to make myself feel better, I'm going to go check all the mirrors in the homes and make sure every last one is truly covered. Journal Entry 27 Ratface has disappeared, and I've got bad luck. A few of the men went out looking for him. I didn't tell them what happened to me, as they'd just assume it was a bad omen. I was checking the mirrors when a cloth fell off one. It was, of course, my own reflection I saw. But for a moment I thought it was a figure in a dark-stained coat. I struck out without thinking. My mother used to say breaking a mirror wasn't bad luck. It was dangerous that the shattered glass was hard to clean, hard to get every little piece, and if a few pieces remained hidden, you wouldn't cover them up when you needed to, that now things could get into this world with no way to stop them. My mother was a very superstitious woman. Still, I spent a long time cleaning up the glass. When I came out, they told me Nathan, which is apparently Ratface's name, had gone missing. No one could find him. They didn't listen when I suggested just waiting around, as sunrise is only a few hours away. A bunch of the braver lads got some lanterns together and went out. Said they'd be back. It's been another hour. And they aren't. 
Journal Entry 28 I must have lost my sense of time. It feels like morning should have come by now. But there's no sun, and no sign of the men that went looking. I'm scared now. Not of goblins or ghosts, but of much more real things. Things like brigands, bandits, animals in the woods. Or my own men having decided they wanted to pinch the cargo and run. And that'd be easy, if there were no other witnesses. I've seen that sort of thing before. This whole Black Hill nonsense would be a great cover to keep us distracted. So I've set up at the wagon with what's left of my candles. Everyone else is by the fire. They're too scared for another scouting party. One of the men found a book bound in black leather in one of the houses. I took it from them because it was making them even more skittish. Started reading it myself. Probably a mistake. It's a collection of stories, handwritten and poorly. Maybe one of the former residents was an amateur writer, or just collected all the weird legends they heard. Most of them are the normal sorts of things, little spirits living in the house, monsters in the woods, trolls that live in the ground. One of them, though, is quite disturbing. It's about an angel, or something like that, that fell down from above, crashed. It didn't die because it couldn't die. But it doesn't live. It's just there. Not dead. Not alive. That's about all there is to the story. Shouldn't be that worrying, I know. But my mind is in that mode. Terror and fear, jumping to conclusions. Thinking about something like that up on the hill. In legends, creatures like that often feast on humans, eating their souls, trying to gain the strength to return to what they once were. It's a good thing I took the book from my men. They would have been horrified. It reminds me of another story my mum told me, about mirrors and children and creatures. That the souls of the young were always more tasty to demons and the like. They'd often gobble them up whole, whereas as older folks they had to torture to make tasty. I don't remember seeing any corpses of children. A town like this had to have children, right? These rural farmer types always have nine or twelve of the buggers. Where are all the children? Journal Entry 29 The fire went out. I don't want to go check on why. It took me a long time to call out to the others. No one answered. Why hasn't the sun come up yet? Pretty, The Journey for Beauty and Freedom by Jason Prisbison Pretty polished and polished until her hands were black and the boots danced in the lamplight. Then she checked on the new hats, made from the hide of some strange beastie Master Rule had slain in the snow last month. They were still damp from the mercury water she'd applied. The fur had turned rusty, however, and looked ready to fall off as if the hat had the mange. She poked with a stiff brush until the hat fairly glowed and then blew off a few specks, wrinkling her nose at the biting metallic smell. She looked at her hands. The shaking was almost imperceptible, unless she tried to pour water into a glass. Hatter's shakes? Maybe. She had heard of them before her father, damn his eyes, had sold her into servitude to stay out of debt as prison. He wouldn't have such a debt if he'd stayed away from the saloons. At least he had taught her to cure hides and polish boots, forced her to when he awoke with a headache. Not much had changed now that she was working for rule. The pay was still nothing. She might still earn a beating if the man's finery didn't shine, but she hadn't given her creepy new master an excuse yet. Unlike her father's drunken friends, he thankfully didn't seem bent on peeking down her blouse. Perhaps later you'll bloom, he had said one night in the dark, but for now you're a wee bit green. He was silent for some moments, leaving her to worry that he might someday be interested in her blouse after all. 
she began hoping he was asleep, but then heard him murmur, tongue thick with drink, now when you bloom, perhaps we can preserve your blossom so it won't wilt. He chuckled in a way that made her cringe, though she wasn't sure why. I've heard there is a man whose ladies never age, even though they ought to be dead. Name was sh says something. He mumbled incoherently, then began to snore. That was her cue to start foraging for some scrap of food. In the cramped house this night, she found a large knife, rusty in spots but still sharp, and some stale crackers. She also tucked away a foul-smelling bottle of the dark liquor Rule drank. If things got much worse, she'd drink it to calm her empty belly, or perhaps hope to fall asleep and never awaken. In her opinion, anyone who willingly drank the stuff was as sharp as a stick of chalk. The next night, Rule came home early. She heard a thunderous shot and footsteps running toward the front door, which flew open. Rule, his bald pate covered in sweat, dashed in. Where's me and you, Hat? Quick now, pretty, I've no time for games. She dashed across the room and handed it to him. He doffed it in a flash. There, that's better. He took a step to the door as someone shouted angrily in the street. He leaned against the wall facing the street and peeked through the dusty glass. Bugger, he's here already. I'll have to take the back door. A cold metal feeling gripped Pretty's guts as she realised that Rule was just like her father, in debt beyond his means. Now what would become of her? In the rear doorway, as an afterthought, he turned to the girl. I won't be back here, and there's no way you can keep up. Take care of yourself. He tipped his hat. You mean I'm free? The stale crackers clawed their way back up her throat, but she kept them down. The lamplight danced across his grinning mouth, sparking off a gold tooth, and then a gust of chill wind blew out the light entirely. This is Malifaux, pretty. Nothing and no one here is free. Good luck. Through the door, now ajar, she listened to the man still shouting out front. Come on out, Rule. You know what's coming. Get out here and face it like a man. At least he wasn't out back, so Rule had a chance to get away. What did she care? Perhaps it'd be better if he died nearby, leaving her something to scavenge. Now that's a terrible thought, she whispered to herself. A thunderous gunshot rang out beside the house. No, she breathed. I didn't mean it. There was no more shouting out front. No sound of anyone living nearby. She was alone. More alone than when her father was out until dawn. More alone than when she had spent the night in the cold rail car with the other children, sleeping on straw and waiting to be sold. She was more alone than when she had been polishing Rule's boots and digging for food in his unkempt house. Now, she was truly alone in Malifaux, a place that scared a well-to-do man with a flintlock, and she had only a rusty knife and nary a penny to her name. A name. She didn't even have that. What kind of a name was pretty? It was the most generic, empty name a girl ever had. But it was hers. It was one thing she owned. That and the rusty knife and... She smiled. And the other hat she'd been working on. Rule hadn't taken it, and it was just as ready as the first one. That was what she needed, a hat. The night was getting chill. Brushing off the rusty fur, she placed it atop her head and took a deep breath. Better to be alone with a hat than simply alone. She wrapped her torn dress around herself. See, she thought, one other thing I own. It's my dress. It doesn't matter who bought it, because no one is coming back for it. She walked to the door and shut it. What season was it here in Malifaux? Instead of Mother Earth's four seasons, warming and cooling the world as needed, the weather here seemed to come from some different woman, like one addicted to opium. When she could afford it, 
the sun shone brighter than it had a right to. And when she ran out of steam, the mother of this world rained tears or buried herself under a heap of snow for as long as she could. Pretty found the Afghan she had slept with, the one which threatened to unravel if she stretched it too far. It had a smell she couldn't identify, like so many things in this dark place. Even if it was just mildew, the smell was comfortingly familiar. Still chilly, she decided she needed something else to keep warm. Lighting a candle, she crept around the room and looked at what there was. No fabric at all. No curtains, having been stolen by a previous boarder, if they had even been there. Two empty brackets high upon the wall testified that even the curtain rod had been sold for scrap. Her belly rumbled then, and she knew that keeping warm was just one of her immediate concerns. Then a thought struck her, one which she would have been too scared and not desperate enough to act on the day before. There had been a battle in the street just minutes before. Someone had been shot. That meant a dead body was laying there, the clothes still warm. She put her candle on the table and crept close to the window to look outside. She saw a pair of boots, motionless, sticking out past a building and into the street. As she watched, a thin shape wove its way between the shadows across the street, visible for an instant as it passed beneath a gaslight en route to the corpse. A black cap on unkempt dark hair and ill-fitting clothes on a lithe frame, a red tartan scarf trailing behind. The face. She jumped back and was glad she wasn't holding the candle, for she surely would have dropped it. The face was a mask of scars, as if someone had drawn on it with a knife and used the same blade to erase the picture. She edged to the window again, and squinted as she grimaced. There he was, crouching on the dead man's shins and rooting through his pockets. Whoever he was, he was about to take whatever spoils there were before she could get them. Pretty's stomach rumbled again, and she wondered if the dead man had had even a few coins on him to buy a loaf of bread. The boy looked up at her, one blue eye and one milky white, squinting through the window. But he waved a filthy hand at her in dismissal, and went back to its work. Pretty did not dismiss the wretch. What he was taking could be the difference between her starving or freezing to death today, or living long enough to find work. She nodded to herself, resolved, and tied the shawl so it would stay around her shoulders. She'd need it outside. She grabbed the knife and, after a moment's thought, blew out the candle. She shut the door quietly and started across the rutted, shadowy street toward the ruffian. Really, how dangerous could he be? He was slightly taller than she, and he had moved quite fast, so she'd have to be crafty. Pretty kept the knife behind her back and probed her heart for something that would help her follow through. She gathered all the hurt, all the abandonment, all the awful feelings she hadn't let herself feel. From beneath the sea of woe, something blue reached her eyes and the tears began to fall. She grimaced as the chill breeze threatened to freeze the tears, but she didn't brush them away. They had a purpose. She sniffled and then sniffled louder. Finally, she just wept. The filthy man's eyes flitted over his shoulder at her, and then back at the man's hand, which he was holding in his own. There was a thin gold ring on the finger, and the wretch pulled again, trying to get it loose. He hissed curses under his breath. Probably didn't wash his hands today, bruh. And then his jaws snapped open, and, after a half-second's hesitation, snapped down on the finger. He wrenched back and forth, grunting, and then, with a satisfying pop, the finger came loose with the ring. As soon as this happened, the wretch reached into his mouth and pulled the finger out, keeping the ring back with his lips. He flung the finger toward a shadow and spit bloody saliva repeatedly. Blah! Definitely didn't wash his hands. Blah! He wiped his mouth on the sleeve of his coat, which was several sizes too large and didn't match his pants. A sob right behind him made him turn and snarl. He quickly put the ring on his finger and made the hand into a fist to shake at her. 
Mine. Your tears ain't gonna work on me, bootlicker. Go back to your fancy master. She sobbed again. Please, I... I don't have anything. Lamplight caught on three tears, one on the tip of her chin, one frozen on her left cheek, and one in her eye, about to follow the dirty path the others had made. The thief chortled. Not true, not true. He relaxed and sat on the dead man's chest. The carcass brought his eyes to the same height as hers. He pointed. You got a fine hat there. Would you trade? His eyes darted to the ring he'd just donned, and then, instead, he reached into his pocket and produced a handful of tarnished brass buttons. For these? He grinned in a way that he supposed was honest, but he had long ago forgotten what honesty was. She bent over the hand, examining the buttons. As she did so, the hat cast a shadow over the wretch, and his smile turned to honest glee in a second. His free hand darted up to snatch the hat free and clear, which was just what she had planned. As his grimy fingernails brushed the hat, her knife lodged solidly between his ribs. It wasn't as deep as she had intended, for she was only a little girl, but ill-fed thieves aren't very thick after all. His eyes flashed rage, but his attempt to give voice to it only expectorated a mouthful of blood. Brass buttons clinked against the cobblestones, just as worthless as his promises, and his lifeless head soon followed. Pretty looked at the two corpses, one atop the other, the one on top steaming a bit in the chill air. She didn't know what to do at first, but then she remembered. She wiped away her tears. There was no need for them now. A smile crept to her lips. Yes, happiness. She could feel that for a moment. She assessed the situation and realised that both corpses would bleed. Both would stain the man's coat if she hesitated. So she got to work. Minutes later, she was back inside. She shivered, trying to forget how cold it had been outside, trying to forget what she'd been through. But she kept going back to that happy moment when she'd tricked the skinny bugger and taken all he had along with everything that dead gentleman had left behind. Now she had a shiny pistol, though it was too big for her to use. She'd best sell that and say as little as possible about where it had come from. She still had her ratty shawl, but over it she was wrapped in a full-grown man's jacket, with only the tiniest bloodstain on the interior, and a long red tartan scarf. She glanced upward at the brim of Rule's spare hat, no, she smiled. My hat. My coat. My hat. My scarf. My knife. She glanced at the thing which had separated the wretch from his life and possessions. My knife. You're like me, she told the blade as the candle flickered. No one thought you was worth a lick. But you showed him, didn't you? Well, we'd better save our candle. We've a bit of scrip and a bit of gold. But that won't get us far. We children of Malifaux have to be careful. Nothing and no one here is free. She blew out the candle and snuggled underneath all the cloth she owned. Out in the street, two men lay naked in the lamplight, their eyes still open in surprise. Both had underestimated those who had nothing left to lose. In the morning, she'd go looking for Rule, not because she had any interest in him, but to learn more about Mr. S. Perhaps her new friend could help him remember the rest of the name. That's it for another instalment of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure. <laughs>